Well, welcome back to See Here Love for our countdown to our top three podcast interviews of all time. And today we look back at one of my most favorite conversations. She is an activist, a Benedictine nun, and an esteemed spiritual voice who has twice appeared on Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday. She's the director of Bennett Vision, a resource and research center for contemporary spirituality. And she has received numerous awards for her work on behalf of peace, justice, and women in church and in society. She's also written The Monastic Heart, 50 Simple Practices for a Contemplative and Fulfilling Life. So let's jump into my conversation with Joan Chittister as we talk about a few simple practices for a contemplative and fulfilling life and the one practice that changed my life forever. Joan, it is so great to have you with us here at See Here Love. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> oh, I love Canada and I'd, I'd you love do. to be open. Yes, I do. Yes, I what, honestly do. Where have you been in Canada? Well, it's, it's from the heart. Uh, after oh. my biological father died when I was three, my mother began to date uh, a Quebecois and he wanted oh. to marry her. And she wanted to marry him, but she said she would not take her baby out of the country. You see, war was, war was hanging over our heads. And she said, I love you and I love Canada and I'd love to be a Canadian. She said, but I will not take my baby out of this country at this time. Wow. Okay. So, so there some connection are. there. Okay. Oh, it's a, it's a connection of the heart and I've always yes. loved it. Joan, that's wonderful. Now. For some of us, we don't know what monasticism is. It's a, it's a new word for some of us, this monastic heart. Yes. Uh, you know, what, what does that mean, the monastic heart? And how do we develop that, that heart of God? And you had said that, but I think just for, for our, our listeners who are unfamiliar uh, with that. Well, I try, to, I try to distill it in this book. And what I'm trying to say is that the monastic heart is about developing the kind of heart that a creator God has when God makes us. This is what I want for you. I want well, not mm. woe. I'm not here to tease you into sin so I can, I can, um, can convict you forever. This is a God who knows <laughs> that we earn, we earn wisdom with difficulty. We learn life the long way and often the wrong way. But in the end, it doesn't make any difference because if we keep growing, if we keep asking the right questions, if we keep centering our lives in the things that last, if we look at the wisdom of the past and say, now I know what wisdom is. It wasn't the quick, fast answer. It wasn't the hit on the streets. It wasn't uh, alcoholism to the end. It wasn't uh, the abandonment of my kids. It, it wasn't any of those things. I, I, I woke up one morning in my life and I decided that I was going to live it well, meaning mm -hmm. with authenticity, with simplicity with profundity. I'm not going to just get pushed off anybody's high diving board at any moment. I'm going to think my life mm -hmm. through and I'm going to grab the things that make me more the best of what I am. Beautiful. Well, Joan, I know you have 50 simple practices for a contemplative and fulfilling life and, okay. and you have them in your wonderful book, The Monastic Heart. And I chose some of my favorites that I'd like to chat with you about. I went through them. I mean, if we could talk about all 50, that would be great. But we would, it might be a, it might be a five part series, Joan podcast, <laughs> but here's the book. Love your book. Um, so here's the, here, let's start with the first one. And maybe what we can talk about is I love in the book, how you explain what it is, kind of the practice of it. And so maybe you can help our listeners know that. So the first one I, that really got me was. Is it statio? Good girl. It, it's the giving a, my a whole marvelous, self to the present joy. moment. It, it, it couldn't be a better choice, Melinda, oh. especially for our culture at this time. Yes. 
it doesn't, it's not difficult uh, to figure out that you don't have to be a major language major, but when you look at the word that is a Latin word, statio, you're looking at what the American mind says, station, right, where we stop, the place where we stop. Mm. So I have, uh, and, and that's not easy. Mm. What does it mean? It means, Melinda, stop, honey. I know you just got off the metro. I know you're dead tired. I saw you throw your coat down on the on the front bench. Mm. Oh, well, you did forget half of the briefcase. Oh God! And they are going to call at three o'clock. And oh, man, what? And 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 I have to get out there and start that souffle. Is it three fifty or four fifty? Oh man! Mm. Just press the button. No, no. The Benedictine says, Melinda. Now sit down. Put your coat down. Drop the briefcase. You can smell it in the food in the kitchen. It's there waiting for you. That's the next thing you're going to do, Melinda. That's the next thing. Now let's get there. Close your eyes. Sit still. Five minutes. Clear the static in your head. It's what the kids call getting your act together. I'm about to go make that souffle. I can't make it too, it'll, it'll get gummy. It'll ruin it. I know it, I can get it done at 400, but at 300, all the cheese will stay soft. I'll do 300. Stazio says, be where you are. Get where you are going and be where you are. Have you ever had a business meeting with somebody who every five minutes looks at their watch? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. They're not there. They're not there. The body has come, but the soul is nowhere mm. near your conversation. Mm. The mind is nowhere ready for anything you ask. This morning, I took a half an hour of Stazio before talking to you. Wow. I know you said, come on at noon. I don't want to come on at noon. I wanted this stuff to pour through my heart, mm. to get into mm. my head. To I, I mean, I've been in this community 69 years. Wow. And I'm still thinking it through. I'm still saying, I, I hear really good things about this Melinda Estabrook. She's worth taking the time to talk to. Mm. I'm going to concentrate on this a little while. I appreciate That's that. That's what's honey. That's what it's about consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's saying when you do something, first collect your mind and your heart. Concentrate on what you're doing. Don't just take this chitister thing and put a check mark in it. If you have eight things to ask, you get them asked. Concentrate. <laughs> Concentrate. So good, Joan. I love that. I feel like I want that on a on a poster or something because you know, as a content creator, as somebody out there, and you understand, like in film and in broadcast and in content, it's busy. And people are constantly just going, going, going. And it's like you don't have time. I shouldn't say that. You know, you can always make the time. But we have that excuse of we're so busy, we've got to keep going. We're literally doing multiple things at the same time on our phones. And, and no wonder, even for myself and friends, we are stressed and anxious and exhausted and feel disconnected. So that, that's this a good rule, one. Melinda, was written in the sixth century and we, have ne we now have neurologists in the 21st century telling us quite clearly that it is impossible. The human body is incapable of doing two things at once. Stazio ah. is where your heart and your mind and your place and your and your relationships come together. Without it, you're a fractured person for the rest of your life. And people will see the excitement and they'll see the fatigue and they'll see the exhaustion and they'll see the hard work. But what what, what they won't be able to see is what you can't see. And that's the inside of you that when we turn this thing off, we can look at one another and say, just like God said, and it, and it was good. Mm -hmm. That work was good. Good. Okay. The next one is 
metanoia. Ah, I have, I have been, I have been the transformation of the self. That's right. Reading. It's not change. Hear the word. It's transformation. I'll give you a short story. I have okay. a friend who years ago was the son of a, of a preacher. Poor kid probably had all church that he could stand for a while. He's about 19 or 20 years, and here is his dad, you know, the, the, the local minister in, with the heart of Christ, and everybody loved the pastor. The kid had had it. He found the, the, the closest Harley or anything like it, climbed on it, and took off over the United States. He, he hit one bad hotel, one terrible party, uh, one line of uh, exotic dancers after another. And about two years later, he woke up staring at the ceiling in the cheesiest place in the middle of the country. And he said, just like the scripture says, what am I doing here? Mm. I have wiped out my whole life. He got back on his bike. He rode all the way back to his family home where his dad was still the most loved pastor in, in the entire state. And he said, Dad, I just want you to know that I know that I was wrong. Nah, his father said, you're very right, Dad. Don't worry about it. Hmm. This young man uh, went on. He, he went to a seminary, and his father had nothing to do with it. He, he was ordained in the seminary and discovered, wow. they gave him a little parish, and he discovered that just talking to small groups, all of it just wasn't what he thought ministry should be. And he became one of the best developers of spiritual materials that the United States had ever seen. Mm. That was transformation. Wow. That's what the Benedictine calls metanoia, being deep-seated, um, cavernlessly whole, open to the self and willing to tear off the masks. We all know what a mask is now. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of icon for us. And you, you take it down and you know you've been posturing. You've been pretending. Everybody thinks I'm so happy in this job. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm absolutely made for it. Everybody thinks that I have no fear. Everybody thinks that I, I was born to swallow that microphone. No, no, <laughs> no. We look at who we are and who we want to be. And we begin that process of transformation. When we take our friends and our family along with us. No, I'm not that anymore. No, it's not a job I do one. Yes, Dad, I know I can get paid more. Uh, doing that than training rescue dogs, but rescue dogs help people, and that's what I want to do. Hmm. That's transforming. That's good. That's, that's so me. good. Joan, wow. Okay, one that I love, um, hospitality, which uh, I love in your book. It's communicate dignity and respectability to all people, especially those oh, that yeah. people don't want to associate with or the less of. Uh, hospitality. Okay. Yeah, and, and it, this is absolutely uh, the center of Benedictinism, quite characteristic of it. The little story that goes with that is this one. When the uh, Roman Empire fell and all the legions were brought home because they couldn't squeeze another penny of taxes out of the colonies, hmm. that meant that all the Romes and the all the roads in the in the empire now were no longer safe. So here you had little families being beaten and raped and pillaged and burned and murdered everywhere. And here's this young man, Benedict of Nursia, and the disciples who heard these things from him and said, I want to live like that. And he said to them, uh, we, we, we have to do something for these people. And so they began to set up Hospitality houses. What, what? I always forget this. But, but uh, who, who was who was the first? Um, um, well, well, you know, it's it's like it's like being a Marriott. It's a Christian Marriott. It's a, the Benedictines were the first hospitality inns 
on wow. the globe. Huh. And they built these little homes. You can still, you if you'll come th through Erie, you can still call the monastery and say, could I have a room for the night? Could I go into one of the hermitages? Could I go to could I go to prayer with the sisters? Uh, would it be possible? And the answer is yes. Oh, absolutely. Please come. Yes, we're waiting for you. And so uh, that happens to be true of Benedict and communities everywhere. It is a sign. It is meant to be a sign of total acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's not those people and us. Right. It's not that race and them. It's us. Yeah. And we owe one another this openness of heart. And if there's real openness of heart, honey, there is an open door to support it. Season 8 is all about getting to know you, the See Her Love community. Here are four ways to connect. Number one, watch See Her Love anytime and anywhere on YouTube and Castle Media. Number two, listen to the See Her Love podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Number three, engage by visiting seeherlove.com or my personal favorite, follow at See Her Love on Instagram. Finally, number four, give to See Her Love in Crossroads by visiting seeherlove.com slash give. Okay, our final one is, and, you know, really connects because I know this, is the desert. It exposes <laughs> our weaknesses, but leaves us, as you say in your book, leaves us full of hope. Now, some people are like, no, the desert is desolate. It's difficult. It's hard. It's lonely. <laughs> I'm parched. I'm thirsty. Um, but I, I like that in exposing the, the weaknesses. Fact of the but matter is. That. Yeah. The truth is that there is a desert in each of us. Hmm. What we grapple with spiritually is the desert in us. Mm -hmm. Something's missing in our lives. And uh, we, we get another hit someplace on a dark corner instead of asking, what am I really missing? Mm -hmm. I'm in this desert. I'm allowing these people to, quote, cure me with alcohol and, uh, and, and drugs with too much money and too little love, with too much love and too little care. Um, th this whole notion is, is the call to us to recognize our spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. Stand in front of a, of a mirror tonight, that's your desert, and say, what is my spiritual need? Where do I go to get it? God is not a prize to be won, the rule of Benedict says. You cannot win God. You cannot merit God. In his first chapter on humility, he says to you what is unlike every other major denominational approach to the spiritual life. He says you can't earn God. You already have God. Hmm. Trust that. Trust that. Now what? Now look at yourself. What do you lack in yourself? That's the big question for the first four degrees of humility. The next four degrees of humility are not, uh, the first four are, well, what's my relationship with God? What do I have there? Do I have a relationship with God? Do I accept the fact that God is within me and calling me on? The next four degrees of humility is, who am I? Hmm. Am I am I showing off? Am I uh, posturing? Am I pretending to the world that I'm great and I have it all and they're nothing? Because if so, I have a couple things to learn. I have to I have to learn to expose myself to myself. Um, you know, uh, in, in Catholicism, um, confession was always a big element. That, that turned into a new industry called psychology and psychiatry. They're both good. They're all three good. It is, this is the call to me to expose myself to myself. I'm not the hotshot. And I can tell if everybody else got tickets for the banquet at the top, at the high table, and I found my my ticket number is thirty six, and I mm. don't like it. 
and I'm not going to go, or I'm leaving early. I'm getting a little message about who I think I am and how I deal with other people and what kind of a mask I am putting up between me and the rest of the world. And once I take care of wanting too much, lying too often, refusing to grow, then I can look at the last four. There are three chapters on humility in this book. Mm -hmm. And this third one is about uh, if you want to know who you are, ask yourself how you're treating or what you think about other people. It's that simple. It's that simple. And that will take you, that little trip will take you out of the desert. God's not a prize to be won. God is a spiritual force within us that is calling us to free ourselves from the chains that are binding us, our addictions, our egotism, our need for power and wealth and a sense of importance. Mm. It's out. We go out to the desert to break our own chains. Beautiful. You know, Joan, when, as somebody is listening and they're really struggling and they're like, okay, I, I hear, you know, the eight simple practices I can do for a contemplative and fulfilling life. I know there's 50, but for someone struggling right now, two years into the pandemic, loss and grief, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would you say to them to encourage them? I mean, obviously we can say it, it'd be great to look through these and begin practicing you know, yeah, these, of course. but what's your encouragement well, in, to somebody who's just, in, wow, overwhelmed in, and struggling? In the very last chapter, I try to bring it together. I talk about the making of the, of the monastic heart. Yeah. What's the stuff you make a monastic heart from? As you've pointed out so well, Melinda, it, it, I mean, there, there are these separate pieces, mm -hmm. and some of them will appeal to you, and you'll know you need them, and some mm -hmm. of them you take for granted. But when you put them all together, it seems to me that this is what has to be left. The monastic heart it, uh, depends on the spirit of tradition. I'm not my own god. I'm not my own company. Uh, there's been wisdom a long time before me, and I have to seek it and understand it. Two, exactly what you talked about, the monastic heart carries with it and abides in it always the spirit of community. Who am I working with? What am I working for? How am I doing it? And, and what, what am I gaining from it myself? The third uh, element of the monastic heart is the spirit of reflection. Think. Um, take yourself in holy leisure to that moment. And, and if you're upset, ask yourself, really, why? Why? Is it possible that the, that the, the thorn of upset is in me, not outside of me? And if it is outside of me, how do I deal with it so it doesn't destroy me? Then uh, the, the fourth element of the monastic card is the spirit of personal growth. Keep growing. None of us are finished. It's, it's going to be the last breath. We'll be learning and also developing and becoming more of a gift to the rest of the world. The monastic heart also lives on a spirit of service. Uh, it's when I was a kid again, there's a line in the rule that says, let everyone, no matter how old or how infirm, be given a task. I said, what? My God, these people are cruel. They're gonna, they're gonna take eighty-year-olds and give them a task. Yeah, you know what the task is? It's separating the mail or folding uh, the wash. Why would you give everybody a task? Because everybody is important to the importance of the community. Everybody, mm. which leads us then finally in the making of a monastic card after tradition, community, reflection, personal growth. Service, the spirit of transcendence, that we're not the end of it. This is the beginning. We're in training. We don't know how or for what or who it is. We just know that life is about more than this. And we're going to stick around and find out what it is. Wow. <laughs> Joan Chichester. Amazing. <laughs> wow. You are 
quite an inspiration and and so I mean these are good I think everybody needs to pick up your book, The Monastic Heart, 50 Simple Practices for Contemplative and Fulfilling Life. And I think you're right. I think, you know, there's 50. And as I went through the book, I kind of like dog-eared pages and highlighted the ones that really resonated or that connected with me, but also ones that um, I know I need to work on a little bit more. Yeah, the serenity right. and silence, the, yeah, the yeah. humility one. Um, yeah, yeah. And so well done. Uh, thank you for lending your voice and thoughts to us and so appreciated well, uh, this time. So it's, good. It's people, it's people like you, Melinda, in all honesty, who, who, who are providing the, the spiritual basis for important thinking in our own lives. Without you, I, the number of, uh, of program directors that I have talked to in the last three months have, have touched my heart deeply, mm. and this one today has been superb. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you so much. Joan, it was a pleasure, and it was great meeting you as well. Hopefully our, our paths will cross again. I hope so, Melinda. Yeah. <laughs> I can look for it, pal. Thank you so much. Thank you, honey. God bless you. Ah, what an incredible conversation, compelling, convicting, and challenging, and the most important questions to ask ourselves. Who am I? And how are you treating or thinking of others will determine who you are? And yes, my word, not just for this year, but for my life came from this conversation, and it's the word statio, being fully present in the moment, be where you are, choose to honor the people that you are with, with your full self, engaged, listening, and learning. And so I think after this conversation, it's time for me and hopefully you to spend some time in silence and reflecting. And I was really moved when in the conversation, Joan shared that. She knew that our interview was at 12 o'clock, but she took some time prior and quite a bit of time to center herself and be ready to speak with me. Because this is what she said. She said, Melinda, I need to honor my time with you and prepare my heart and myself to be fully with you, fully present. And it was probably one of the most incredible things I've heard from anybody that I've interviewed, that it wasn't just another interview on the circuit, but that she actually intentionally spent time thoughtfully, quietly, at peace to prepare for her time with me. I want to be like Joan. Now, here were your comments after you heard this conversation from L. York 2018. This is what she said. Joan is an extraordinary human being, and her new book is deep, wise, and rich in spiritual lessons. Everyone needs this book. From Deb on YouTube, Joan Chittister for president with the US flag. And also from YouTube, Trish said this. This was such a good interview. I watched the whole thing this week. Well, you can watch my entire interview with Joan on our YouTube channel. Go there right now. You know, as I said, I want to be like Joan, giving my whole self to the present moment stadio. Metanoia, transforming of myself, creating community, working at serenity and inner peace, working towards peace and justice. So I hope those practices encouraged you. And I hope you'll take some time today and in the week to listen to God's spirit speaking to you and to begin transforming more into the likeness of himself. And if you need prayer, we have friends that will pray for you and listen to you. So call this number, 1-866-273-4444. And there will be someone 24-7 to listen and care for you. Well, thanks for joining us. And always know, as I love to say, that as you do Stadio, as you do Metanoia, as you search and live in peace, you are seen heard, and deeply loved by God, the one calling you to a more fulfilling life with him. And don't forget, next week, we unveil our number three podcast interview of all time. Thanks for joining us. See Here Love thanks our partners who make this show possible. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded, nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Center for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing See Here Love. You can write to Crossroads, P.O. Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs.